Canada, où il est professeur à la Collège de France, il est aussi membre de la French Academy of Science, et Stéphane est l'un des experts mondiaux sur la théorie du deep learning, et il va nous expliquer quelques théories. Bonjour. Donc, oui, je vais vous parler aujourd'hui about deep network, but uh, trying to take a mathematical standpoint to try to understand why it is, first of all, so difficult to understand them and the kind of mathematical tools which are involved and ideas that have been around. So let me begin with the problem, uh, first of all, high dimensional learning. Uh, the problem is to estimate a function f of x, which for example could be the class uh, of an image, from uh, data x, where x is a very high dimensional vector. So that's the core of high dimensional learning. And in supervised learning, as you know, you have example, for example, of images and example of labels, out of which you need to estimate f of x for any x. So we'll look at problems such as image classification, but also regression problem in a totally different world, which is physics. In physics, if you want to learn physics, then uh, what you would like to do is, given the state of a system, so X will then describe the state of a system, for example, a molecule, the position of the atoms, the number of charge, you'd like to compute the energy. If you can compute the energy, by doing some kind of regression from a database, then you have access to the forces through the derivative. So basically, you can learn physics from data. Now, the other type of problems we are facing in machine learning are unsupervised uh, learning. And in the case of unsupervised learning, what you really want to do is to estimate the probability distribution of the data. So in this case, what you have is a set of x, which corresponds to realization of your uh, random process whose probability distribution you'd like to learn, and uh, you would like to try to estimate uh, p of x. Now, you have to realize that this is an incredibly difficult uh, problem. If you take the example of such a texture which corresponds to the vorticity of turbulent flow, since the 1950s, all mathematicians and physicists have been trying to understand what are the probability of such a probability distribution. There has been many hypotheses on that, very poor model until now, and as we will see, deep network seems to be able to synthesize very well such textures. Why? What is behind that? And what is, of course, much more spectacular is that, so this could be interpreted as a stationary ergodic process, but as you know, autoencoders can synthesize much more complex random processes, which are totally non-stationary, non-ergodic, such as faces. What does that mean? What are we doing by doing such a thing? Now, there will be one common question which will be behind all that, is that in order to be able to solve such high dimensional problem from relatively limited amount of data, you need to estimate an object, an f of x, which is extremely regular. And one of the mathematical questions which is below all this is to understand the notion of regularity in very high dimension. So this question, you'll, be, you'll see this question appear constantly across the talk. Okay, so first of all, why the problem is so difficult I suppose you all know about it, but let me emphasize it because it's really at the core of all high dimensional learning. Naively, one could think that this is just a simple interpolation problem because you want to estimate f of x given the value of f in different point xi. So if you have a new point x, the immediate reaction is to think, let me take the neighbors of this point x where I know the value of my function and the value of the function in x, if the function is regular, I can estimate it by averaging the value of the function in the neighbors. That works very well in low dimension. It never works in high dimension. So why? Why? Because the neighbors are always extremely far. And why the neighbors are very far, that's due to dimensionality. If you just take a simple cube, 0, 1 in dimension d. If you want to guarantee that you have a neighbor at a, di at a distance epsilon, then what you need to do is to sample your cube 
every epsilon. Now, how many samples will you need? You will need epsilon to the minus d. Now, suppose that for epsilon you take 1 over 10, which is not very uh, small, and for d you take 100, you already have 10 to the power 100, which is more than the number of atoms in the universe. So this is absolutely huge. Now, d is not going to be 100, but rather a million in the case of an image. What that says, it says that in your very high dimensional space, your data, even if you have millions of images, this is very small. They are very isolated, like a bit the stars in the sky. So if you want to interpolate your function in between, what you'll need is to have very strong prior about the regularity of the function. So that's the key thing, is that if you want to estimate f of x when x is in a high dimensional domain. The domain may not be the whole space 0, 1 in dimension d. Maybe it's going to be smaller, but still it will be in high dimension. You need to have some very strong regularity prior of f in your domain. And again, the question will be, what's the regularity? And how does that relate to deep network? OK, so what kernel classifiers try to do in such a situation, high dimensional learning? So suppose you have a problem of classification of two class, the red and the blue points, which are a bit of a mess and very far away all from one another. The idea is basically to do a change of variable. So you take your x and you transform it into a phi x, which is a set of new variable that sometimes people call features that are going to describe your state. And you do your change of variables so that the problem is going to be linearized. That's what you always do in math when you have a complicated nonlinear equation. You try to find a way to change your variable so that it becomes linear by miracle. Well, here you do the same kind of thing. The only thing is that your variable is not one dimensional, it's a million dimensional. And if indeed you can separate the two population, as you know, then you can make a separation with a hyperplane. So the classification, you just do it by projecting your phi of x on the orthogonal to the hyperplane. And that's done by computing the inner product with w plus the bias which corresponds to the position of the hyperplane. And if that's positive, then you are in class 1. If that's negative, then it's in the class 0. You do the projection like that. OK, so finding the hyperplane is not so difficult. It's relatively easy, now we know how to do that. What is again very difficult is to find this miracle change of variable which separates the data. So the regularity of the problem is hidden within the change of variable which is able to do this separation. So there is from there basically two strategies. One, you know well your problem and you know in advance what will be the appropriate change of variable because you have some prior. If the problem is really complex, you may not have enough information, and you may want to learn the change of variable. And that's what neural networks are doing. Basically, they are learning how to progressively change this variable in order to linearize the problem. So let me briefly uh, review the standard results on neural networks. When you have a one hidden layer uh, neural network, which means that your input x is going to be transformed by a linear operator uh, to obtain the result here, and then this inner product, I can view that as an inner product, is going to be transformed by a nonlinearity such as a relu or a sigmoid. That's what does the first layer, and the second layer is just to aggregate linearly these coefficients in order to build an estimation of the function f you want to build. So that's a one hidden layer network. And in uh, approximation theory, these are called ridge function approximation. Because you see this function here, it only varies along a one dimensional direction. And in all the other direction, when x is orthogonal to wm, it doesn't vary. OK? So the question is, can you represent any function with a one-layer neural network? And you have this famous universal approximation theorem, 
which tells you, yes, it's possible. So to do that, you will need to optimize the weights, which are the weight here and the weight of the final layer. So this theorem, which basically was proved in between uh, 92 and 94, uh, by succession of uh, hypotheses, basically tell you for almost any nonlinearity, as long as the nonlinearity is not a polynomial, then you are guaranteed that when the number of neurons m goes to infinity, you will be able to approximate f with an approximation fm with an error that goes to zero. So for many people, when that theorem came out, people thought that's a proof that you can do anything you want with a neural net. Now, this is wrong. This is wrong, and if you look into the proof, it's really no big deal. This theorem is very nice, but it's not much more powerful than showing that you can decompose a function in a Fourier basis. In fact, if you take an exponential, complex exponential for rho, you exactly have a decomposition in a Fourier basis. So why do I say here no big deal? Because that doesn't break the curse of dimensionality. The problem is that the error goes to zero, but it goes incredibly slowly to zero so that the amount of data you need is back to bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. Now, to get a feel again for that, because it's really important to understand this point, to understand why learning is difficult. Let me try to see a little bit what are you doing with such a network when the nonlinearity is a relu. So a relu is rho of u is the max of u and zero, okay? Now, suppose that I am in one dimension, so I'm going to begin with the simple case where x is a one-dimensional variable, and suppose that my data is uniformly spaced over x, so the xi corresponds to the different n multiplied by epsilon. If I do a linear combination of relu like that located in these points, Basically, what I do is a piecewise linear approximation of my function. Now, if I know that the function is a little bit regular, for example, suppose that it has bounded derivatives, so you can say it's Lipschitz, which says that the increment between f at x and x prime is bounded by the distance between x and x prime, then, of course, the error is going to go to zero. And you can quickly compute it because since you know that you've done a sampling by a distance epsilon, you will always be epsilon away from an example, so that will be smaller than epsilon. And how many points do you need to have a distance smaller than epsilon? The number of points, if you are on the interval 0, 1, is going to be epsilon to the power minus 1. So that proves that the error is going to decay like the number of neurons, the at the power of minus 1. So the error is going to decay fast. But why will it go fast? Because I'm in one dimension. Let me do the same thing in dimension D. In dimension D, it's the same thing. I'm going to build a piecewise linear approximation with my relu. I'm going to, again, suppose that my function is locally regular. If I move around x, the change of f is going to be bounded by x minus x prime in norm. If all my points are at the distance epsilon, I'm going to have an error smaller than epsilon, but now how many points do I need? As I said, it's going to be epsilon to the power minus d. So if I now replace epsilon by m, I'm going to have that the error is going to decay like m to the power minus 1 over d which means that to divide the error by a factor 2, I need to divide to increase the number of points by 2 to the power 1 million, which is a number which is unimaginable. Okay, so basically I cannot learn if the only thing I know about f is that it's locally regular. I cannot do better than that. No nonlinear method will do better than that. So somewhere, there must be stronger regularity because you have these very impressive deep networks which gave, I suppose, the results that you've seen uh, in the previous courses and uh, previously uh, 
Uh, you probably saw a lot of these results with DeepNet. So let me summarize the idea. One thing which is very important to understand is that a neural network, which is just a series of fully connected layer with no prior in the architecture, if you put many neurons, is basically not going to learn. In order to, to learn, you need to put prior information in your network. And the prior information, how do you put it? By specifying the architecture. So in here, I'm speaking about the architecture, which is going to link a data x okay, to the function f of x, which I want to approximate. So what is this architecture? In a deep network, deep convolution network, and I put here the name of Jan because he really had, I consider, a very important impact by specifying these architectures. Again, these are not just any neural network. They are convolutional networks, and they are very structured. So in what sense are they structured? The first thing is that the linear operator, which links one to the next layer, is a convolution. Why is it a convolution? It's a convolution, and it's a convolution with a very small filter, typically 3 by 3 or 5 by 5. So why is that? Because you basically assume some kind of invariance or covariance. If I have an object here or an object here, it's the same object. So there is no reason to put different weights here and here. And if your weights are translated, translation invariance, then you have a convolution. The second thing which is important is that you have many layers, and across the different layers, you begin to subsample. So what is the network doing from one layer to the next? A point here is going to be obtained by a series of convolution and a summation across these channels. And these channels have some structure that we'll be speaking about. So you iterate this until the last layer, and from time to time, you subsample. You are going to end up with a small last layer, and then you do a linear combination, and you get your approximation. Okay? So this whole network has typically millions of parameters, and these millions of parameters are optimized by setting a loss function which evaluates the error over the database. And you minimize this error with typically a stochastic gradient descent. Then you cross your finger. You hope it's going to converge somewhere that will be a good solution. And then you evaluate on test example. Now, the big surprise is that people have been obtaining exceptional results. And what is very interesting is that these results are not just for images, but there were beautiful results all over the place. Over images, speech classification, you have the state of the art, music analysis, language translation, regressions in physics, signal and image generation. So obviously here, these structures seem to capture something generic about all these problems, which appears to be very different. One way to think about it, again, is that you've been able to learn from a very limited amount of data, which means that from this limited amount of data, you've learned an approximation of your function f. That means that this function can be approximated from a limited number of parameters, so it has to be very regular in some sense. What's the regularity? So there is two kinds of questions you can ask and here I'm going to come to the point of Jean. One question is, you have an input data. You are going to learn all these weights. In other words, you are going to estimate your function f. You have an optimization problem, and you have an estimation problem. And then you have a second problem, which is, suppose that God gives you the best solution possible, the best possible weight are you going to get a good approximation of your function f? OK? In other words, is the structure super, sufficiently powerful in order to approximate the original function f? And that's the approximation problem. So you are going to have 
courses on the optimization problem. In particular, Francis will speak about that, and I'm sure uh, other people in the course will be speaking about that. I'm going to concentrate mostly on the approximation problem, but I'll be also showing the link on uh, the optimization problem. Learning is the union of the two. You need to set up a model. In order, you need to understand the approximation problem. You need to optimize the model. You need to learn. OK, so the way I'm going to try to approach that problem is by trying to create simpler networks and to try to understand the regularity that they are capturing. And one thing that is going to appear as important is the fact that these networks do multi-scale decomposition because of the subsampling. One coefficient here depends upon a local uh, set of coefficients. One coefficient here from a more global, and one coefficient here at a deeper layer because of the cascade of an even more global. So you have a progressive aggregation of information. The second thing that we're going to see is the fact that you have prior information about regularities relatively to set of groups. The last thing will be sparsity. And OK, before I'm going to see, I'm going to show how you can reach on something like ImageNet. Just by learning a sparse dictionary, you can reach performance such as the one that you get on a fully learned deep network. But before going to classification, I want to begin with some problems which are a bit simple. So I said unsupervised learning. They were very nice experiments by a group, uh, Matthias Bege, showing that if you give a texture, you learn your network, let's say, with ImageNet. You put in your uh, input a texture, such as a turbulence. You look at the layers produced by your network. You look at correlation coefficients of these layers. And you try to resynthesize new image having the same correlation coefficients across the channels. And you synthesize beautiful texture, which looks like the original one. Questions, what does that mean mathematically? How come you can solve these problems, which were thought to be so difficult in mathematics and physics? Do you really solve them? Other type of unsupervised learning problem, autoencoders, that you know, you take an input image, you have a first network which transform it into something that looks like white noise, and you try to invert this first en encoder by a decoder which reconstructs an image which is very close to the original one, and then you make new synthesis by making a new white noise here and resynthesizing new images. And by doing that, for example, if you do a synthesis on a database of bedrooms, from white noise you can synthesize bedrooms. But what is quite amazing is that if you take two inputs corresponding to two, let's say, bedrooms, you do a linear combination of this input, and you reconstruct from the noise, let's say, which is the average of the two noise, what you're going to reconstruct is, again, a bedroom. As if you had taken your bedroom images, you had completely flattened out the bedroom images so that the middle of two bedrooms is now a new bedroom. You can do the same thing with faces, and you have this kind of result. So you see that there are very amazing properties that you get out of these networks. And again, why? Mathematically, what is that related to? OK, so as I said, what I'm going to try to do is to go from simple to more complicated. Simple to more complicated means try to understand the different components of a network. One of the first thing is this architecture in layer. And this architecture in layer, one of the reasons why it is there is, as I mentioned, the fact that it builds multi-scale representation. Now, in mathematics, there is a tool to understand these multi-scale representation, which are wavelets. So I will begin with that. Second thing, why do you need this nonlinearity? And what I'll be showing is that the nonlinearity can have very different behavior in different contexts. On the first layers, when you apply it on uh, filters such which looks like wavelets, 
The ROLU plays a very interesting role allowing to connect information across scale through phase. And that will be one of the elements. And I'll show in what sense that allows to understand why you can build uh, stochastic processes such as turbulences and why you can begin to do regression of relatively complicated problems such as uh, simple image uh, classification and quantum chemistry. Now, in the first phase, I'm going to try to work with deep net without learning. Try to understand, if I have some prior information, can I use this structure and specify the filter, and how far will I go? And about five years ago, I did a bet with Jan uh, Lequin saying, look, probably within the next five years, someone will find a way to specify analytically the filters so that we won't need to learn them at all. Just you have to understand well enough prior information about the world. And five years afterwards, basically I lost. So I lost, I had to pay uh, three-star Michelin restaurants, so that was a serious loss. <laughs> so at least what you can gain from a loss is to understand why you lost. So the next question, once you admit, OK, you lose, you need to learn. The next question will be, what is the minimum amount that you can learn in order to reach a performance such as AlexNet? And what I'll show is that you can learn a single matrix, a dictionary, and one of the ways to approach this problem is through sparsity. In other words, if you build a representation such as multi-scale representation and use a sparse dictionary, which are ideas that have been around uh, in the community of machine learning, then you can reach AlexNet performance. But what will be interesting is that we'll see. It will back, go into a deep net performance, and we'll see why deep net are so important for learning these structures. So that will be the last part. OK, so let me begin with multi-scale. Why is it so important? because it is a way to break the curse of dimensionality. When you have an n-body problem, n particles which are interacting, let's say with this particle, okay? This particle, you could be in physics, it can be pixels, it can be people in a social network. Where are the very strong interaction? Typically with the very strong neighbor, with your family, with the neighbor pixels. Now, to look at the interaction with more far away particles, what you can do and what is done often in physics is you regroup all these particles. Instead of looking at the interaction of each of them with this one, you build an equivalent field and you look at the global interaction of all these particles with this one. And more away, far away particles, like imagine uh, Russians, you don't need to look at the interaction of each Russian somewhere in Siberia on your life. But you cannot neglect them because all Russians together, they define Russia. And if, for example, Russia has a political tension with your country, it can affect yourself. So groups are important. And you want to look at the effect of the global group. Now, if you group like that, how many groups are you going to go? You're going to go from d particle to log d groups. And if you are in log d, you take the exponential, you are linear in d, and you break the curse of dimensionality. <coughs> But what is very hard? What is very hard is to understand the interaction between the groups. And that's essentially the big problem. To separate scale, since the 1980s, we know how to do that, and the wavelet transform will do it for you. What we don't know since basically the 70s is how to compute the interaction between the scales. And what I'll try to show is that that's one of the contribution of DeepNet they are able to compute this interaction across scale, and this is why they can build models that we couldn't build before. And here, the ROLU will be very fundamental. OK, so scale separation. How do you separate information across scale? You take a wavelet. So what is a wavelet? A wavelet is basically a local sine wave. It's a sine wave that you localize by multiplying it by a window, let's say a Gaussian. So you have the cosine part and the sine part. It's a, a complex wave. 
Now, your wave is very local, so you are going to change its size. It's a bit like a frequency parameter by dilating it. So that's a big wavelet, and when you reduce the scale, you get a finer wavelet. Like a sine wave, you are going to change its orientation with a rotation parameter. And then you are going to filter your signal with all these filters. So you are going to do a convolution like in a deep net, with all these wavelets. Basically what you do is you explode the information in different scale, different angle. Now, as you know, a convolution in space in the Fourier domain is a product. So if you look at the Fourier transform, that's called the transfer function of your filter, in the Fourier domain it's just going to cover a small blob like this. It's a band pass filter. If you dilate your wavelet, uh, if you rotate your wavelet, you are going to basically rotate the filter. These are the different filters in the Fourier domain, the different frequency channels they select. If you dilate the wavelet, you are going to dilate the filter, and you are going to cover the whole frequency plane like that. You basically divide your information in different scale, different orientation, and you can reconstruct the signal. Okay, one problem if you want to build a model, for example, of turbulence or things like that, is that if you look at the information in two different channels, they are not correlated. If you try to correlate them, you can verify you are going to get zero. So the information in two different channels are linearly appears as if they were independent. Now, let's look at the transform. You take an image. These are the finest scale coefficient with a different wavelet, different orientation, cosine, sine. This is the low pass filter that you are going to split again different wavelets. The low pass filter, you split again. So you can view that as a naive uh, neural net with a bunch of convolution, subsampling, convolution, subsampling, but there is no nonlinearity here. Now, if you look at the information at different scale, this looks very much like this, very much like this. So they are very dependent, but statistically they are not correlated. But the question is how to capture this dependence. That's where the ReLU is going to play a very important role. So let me show you what would happen if you don't uh, use this dependence. So how do you, I'm going to go back to this problem of unsupervised learning and take the point of view of a physicist. You want to characterize a stochastic processes whose realization looks like this. And you want to build a model. What would you do? One way to do it is to say, I'm going to specify some moments. So I'm going to do some transformation of x and look at the expected value and measure this expected value. This is a moment. And now I want to build a model which is conditioned by these measurements, these moments. And what do you do in information theory or statistical physics? Because you don't have any more information, you say that your model, which will respect this condition, is the one that is going to have a maximum entropy. And here you have a convex optimization problem, and you can show that the solution is just going to be an exponential distribution that depends upon your moment. That's totally standard approach to standard physics. Now, what people are usually do doing, you need to compute these moments, and what you can compute are second order moments. In other words, the correlation of two points which are at a distance m. If you do that, you are going to get a Gaussian distribution. This is going to be a quadratic form, and that's the kind of model that you get. These images have exactly the same second order moments, and obviously they've lost all the geometric structure. That's Kolmogorov model of turbulence, basically. So the question is how to go beyond. The reason that doesn't work is because essentially the frequency, the scale don't interact. Deep net realization that I showed looks much better. Question why? Why the key is here the ReLU? Why is it the ReLU? Because the ReLU is going to do the connection between the scale through phase. So let me explain that briefly. You have a wavelet which has a certain phase. 
What you do in a network, if your filter is a wavelet, is you are going to take your uh, x and you are going to make a convolution with your real wavelet. But you are going to apply a rectifier over that. Okay, so you can put the real part outside. That's what you're going to do. Now, let me observe. I can separate the modulus and the phase. What I want to show is that here the relu essentially acts on the phase of your wave. Why? Because a relu is a homogeneous function. If you multiply a, a, a factor A by alpha positive, the alpha can get out. So if I put the modulus here, I can get it out, and I'm going to get the relu of the phase component. So it's only the phase which is going to be transformed by the relu. Now then you can analyze what's happening. You can analyze it by computing a Fourier transform relatively to the phase. And what you're going to see is that basically the action of a relu is going to be preserve the modulus, but the phase, you are going to compute harmonics of the phase. And because you get these harmonics of the phase, I'm going to show you, you build all the link between the uh, different scale, and you can get the statistics that you want. So to understand that, let me take your wavelet to which I apply the relu. And in the Fourier relatively to the phase, it's like taking the modulus of the wavelet coefficient, and the phase has an exponent k. Now, what does it do? The problem was, when you have information in two different scale, it corresponds to two different frequency bands. They don't overlap. They don't communicate. If you take a relu, it's going to accelerate the phase. So this component, if k equals 2 is going to be moved in frequency, k equals 3 moved a little bit, until the point where their Fourier support correlates. In other words, you are going to create correlation through this nonlinearity across the different scale. For liquid relu, the same will happen. The calculation is a bit uh, more involved, but exactly the same thing. It's really due to the nonlinearity behavior of the, of the relu. And if you do the same thing on images, what's happening when you do a rectification, you are going to multiply the frequencies, so something which lived in two different frequency bands. When you apply your relu, this one is going to move here, and suddenly they are in the same domain. They can correlate. So let's replace the simple second-order moment by second-order moment of the relu. So do the same kind of thing that Matthias Bedge was doing with a single relu, OK? And then compute the maximum entropy distribution. That's what you get suddenly you get random processes whose realizations are very similar to the original one. And now that you've understood the math, you can do the same thing with much, much less moments than the one that were used in a deep network. That doesn't mean that you understand everything. We don't understand what is really the physics that is being captured, and we'll look at non-ergodic processes. OK. So. First point, the relu builds the relation across the scales. And that was to try to define model of stationary ergodic processes. What about classification? In classification, one thing which is going to be important, as I said, is when objects are translated, essentially they are the same. So you may want to be invariant to translation, or at least when you translate, transl you would like to linearize the effect of the translation so that you can see if two objects are close or far away. <coughs> so to try to build something which is invariant to translation, basically it amounts to average. If you want to build a linear operator which builds something which is invariant to translation, the only thing you can do is to basically average all the translation position. In other words, average the signal. Now, you can do, if you do that, you lose all the information. But you can do the same thing on the wavelet coefficient with the relu and average that. So basically here, what am I doing? I am going to build a network where, as I said initially, I'm not going to learn the filter. I'm going to impose the filter. 
and I'm going to see how far I can go by doing that. And as I said, here I use wavelets to separate scale. Now I use the ROLU to build the connection across the scale. And then I'm going to average to have an invariant to translation. The problem is that if you average, you lose information because you had all the variability of your ROLU image, which has been completely averaged. If you want to have a representation which has more information, you would like to recover the information that was lost. What is the information that was lost? Here I took this image, which happened to be a ROLU output, and I averaged it. So what I lost is the high frequencies of this image. How can I capture the high frequency of this image? I can take this image and compute its wavelet coefficients. These are the high frequency of the image. But now I want to build something which is invariant to translation. I want to build all the connections. Well, I can just reapply a ROLU and then average. And that begins to look a little bit more like a neural net because I have the different scale and I begin to apply iteratively the ROLU. Why do I need to do that? Because if I just do it once, I will lose too much information. I want to get also these moments. And that's what I will call here a scattering transform. You basically apply a wavelet transform, a ROLU, a second wavelet transform, a second ROLU. Now, one very important point property here is that this is going to be stable to deformation. And that's important in physics, in image processing, audio, many problems. If you slightly deform an image, you expect that the image is not going to change a class. If you, uh, a digit which is deformed, it's still about the same digit if the deformation is small. A uh, dog which is slightly deformed is still a dog. It's not a cat. So you want stability to deformation. Now, one very important property is that if you take an image, you deform it, which amounts to make a translation which depends upon space, in this domain of uh, a deep net coefficient or scattering, the Euclidean distance is of the order of the size of the deformation. So the deformation behaves well. OK, let me first briefly show an application to quantum chemistry. So in quantum chemistry, the problem is x is not an image, is the position and the charge of a molecule. f of x is the energy. When the molecule is translated, it doesn't change. Rotated, it doesn't change. Slightly deformed, it's going to change slightly. And you have multi-scale property because you have long-range interactions due to electrostatic force and short-range interaction due to neighbor atoms. OK, so the goal is, can we compute that without knowing anything about Schrodinger equation, just from data and this prior information? Now, in physics, what is the image, in some sense, that you compute? You compute the electronic density. If you know the electronic density, then you can access to the energy. So what is the electronic density? Is the probability to encounter an electron at any position of space. So you will encounter close to the nuclei of the atom, and in between the two atoms, you have a high probability. That's the chemical bond of your molecule. OK, but of course, you don't know this because you don't know how to compute the, solve the Schrodinger equation problem. So we are going to do it naively. The information we know is we have charges, and I'm going to locate the charge at the nuclei. So that will be my input data, an image or a cube of data. Okay? X of u is just the, all the charges located at the position of the nuclei. And now I'm going to send that through a wavelet network. So if you take your x, which is a sum of Dirac, you make a convolution with a wavelet. A convolution of a waveform with a Dirac gives you back the waveform but translated at the Dirac location. So what's happening? It's as if each atom emits a wave, all the wave interact, they sum up, and then you collapse with your ROLU. And you're going to get patterns of interference. These patterns of interference capture the geometry of your, uh, of your molecule. So what you do is you build a network with 
this in three dimension, first order, second order coefficients. Then you average with your phi. You get your coefficients, which are going to be invariant to translation rotation. And then you do a simple linear regression. So the only thing that we're going to learn is the last layer. Question, can you do with such a structure as well as a deep network? The answer is yes on the current database in chemistry. So in these chemistry problems, you have database about 100,000 organic molecules, but these are small atoms and of composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrate, and so on. And if you look at the air produced by a network like that where you didn't learn anything besides the last layer, you get an error which is of the order of 0.5 kilocalorie per mole. If I give you this figure, is because this figure is about the same that the one that DeepNet compute, and it's about the precision that you get with numerical calculations on the Schrodinger equation with a technique called the DFT. But, but, these databases are databases of small molecules, 30 atoms. And now I'm going to show you that things completely change when the problem gets much more complex. Let's look at image processing, and that's what we'll see. So that's the work of Joanne Brunat for uh, his uh, thesis. If you look in, oops, in image processing, when the problem is simple, like MNIST, basically you want to recognize a digit, the main source of variabilities, there are translation, deformations. If you do a network where you prescribe the filters or you learn everything as was done by Jan in his early publications, you get about the same error. If you work on textures, you want to classify texture, you do it with such a network or the network uh, where you learn everything, you get about the same error. If you do it on ImageNet, totally different. Here, AlexNet in 2012 got an error of 20%. If you use such a network, you get an error of 60%. And now we are with ResNet with 200 layers at the level of an error in between 5 and 10%, so well below. So somewhere you need to learn, to come back to the question of Jean. But what do you need to learn if you need to learn something? That's going to be the question. OK, if you look at the field, the name of the field, initially, it's what's called pattern recognition. So maybe somewhere there is this notion of patterns. I've been speaking about groups, about scales, but never about patterns. So should we look for patterns? Let's try to look for patterns. So to look for patterns, one way to do it is to represent these patterns in a dictionary. And that was the idea of representation in dictionaries. And that has a long past uh, from approximation theory applied to denoising and then applied to classification by uh, Julien Meral, his collaborators. And since then, it began to work, apply on uh, a deep network. OK, so what's the idea? The idea is if you have a piece of data x, you are going to store your pattern in a dictionary. So the patterns are basically the columns of the dictionary. And you want to represent x as a linear combination of very few patterns. That means you are going to say that x is equal to this matrix D multiplied by z, where z is a vector which is essentially 0 almost everywhere besides the selection of the few patterns, so these very few coefficients. So, how do you compute this code Z, which makes a sparse expansion of your data? What basically you do is you solve an L1 optimization problem, which amounts to say you would like that DZ is close to your X, but you would like also that Z is sparse. And to impose that Z is sparse, you are going to multiply, you are going to add a penalty by the L1 norm of Z. So, you now have a convex cost, and you can try to compute the z by minimizing this convex cost. And there are algorithms to do that. 
So what's the idea of these algorithms? The idea of these algorithms is you have two terms here. You have one term which is a quadratic term that you would like to minimize. If you compute the gradient of the quadratic term, you are going to get a term like identity minus d transpose d. But you are also going to want to minimize this L1 norm. And to minimize the L1 norm, you are going to see that the operator that is going to appear is a soft thresholding, basically which will have a tendency to set coefficient to 0, to make them more sparse, by decreasing their amplitude. So what is a soft thresholding? It's basically like a relu on the positive and the negative side. What it does, it takes the amplitude of the coefficient, it decreases it by alpha, and it keeps the sign of the coefficient. So that's what a soft thresholding is. So basically, you have this iterative algorithm. Now, if you are obsessed by deep network, you can view that as a deep network. Okay? What it does, like a residual deep network, you have x, you are going to transform x by your transpose matrix, and then you are going to iteratively apply your nonlinearity that you could row it as a sum of ROLU, apply your matrix, then do a connection, reapply it with different uh, potential bias. And if you want to have a convolutional dictionary, you get a convolutional network. So see here, I could use a soft thresholding of a relu. The relu here plays a totally different role. The relu here plays the role of sparsifying my different component to get a sparse output. OK, so how are we going to use that? One of the beautiful aspects of this deep network is the optimization side. Now I know how to take an X and decompose it in a dictionary. And the idea is, OK, let's try to apply a classifier, and then I'm going to get my output. But all this now I can view it as a deep net. And if you want to learn the patterns, it amounts to learn the dictionary. Because I don't know in advance what are the patterns. So I need to learn the dictionary. And to learn the dictionary means learn one matrix, but which appears, it's the same matrix which appears in the different layer. It corresponds to the iteration of the algorithm. And you do a gradient descent on that. So then there is a whole work in order to make sure that you don't have many layers. That kind of thing, now you can do it with about 10 layers by using a Motopi strategy on the networks. And you do the optimization. So how do you do the optimization? You want to minimize the loss. The loss is typically going to be a cross-entropy loss, as we do in deep net for classification. You have your example xi. You have your label. And the loss is essentially going to depend upon the matrix D and the parameter of the classifier. You optimize it jointly with a stochastic gradient descent. OK, what does it give? So let me come back to ImageNet. If you do ImageNet on, uh, by just doing a scattering transform and averaging, you have a huge error, 60%. If you try to learn directly the dictionary on x, OK? So I take x, I apply my dictionary and the classifier, and I optimize that. You still have a very big error, about 50%. Now, if you do both, you first apply the scattering transform, and then you apply the dictionary and the classifier. The error drops to 18%, which is below Alexnet. So what happened? You see x here has much too much variability. Variability due to translation, rotation, deformation, patterns, and so on. The dictionary has to be huge to capture all this variability. It cannot be so big, so you have a big error. But if you begin by neutralizing all the variabilities which is due to geometry, and you know geometry, and you know that if it's due to geometry, then the appropriate filters are basically wavelengths. Once you neutralize this, you still have too much variability. But you build a dictionary. But this dictionary is not a dictionary of image pattern. It's a dictionary of multi-scale scattering patterns. Then, because you neutralize the, the, a, lot, a big part of the variability, 
with a relatively small dictionary, you can reach image net performance, uh, Alex net performance. And now we are trying to work, of course, like everybody, to try to improve that. But the important thing is that when you go from here to here, you have a huge jump, which says that, yes, you need to learn, but in fact, the learning may not be so complex, mathematically speaking. Still, one of the questions is now to understand what is the theory about why these uh, dictionary learning why it works so well, how come they do improve so well the results. Okay, I now would like to finish on autoencoder. So I'm doing a big survey. The reason why I'm doing the big survey is because I would like to show that behind all these problems apparently different, you see the same kind of mathematical tools appearing. So, deep network. Uh, Autoencoders. So again, I'm back to a problem of unsupervised learning. But the big difference compared to what I did on uh, uh, stationary processes such as uh, turbulence and so on is that you would like to model some very complex non-stationary process such as phases. So what people do? As I said, you have an encoder which takes an image X and basically whiten this image X. It's transformed X in a lower dimensional white noise. And then it takes the lower dimensional white noise computed from X and it tries to resynthesize an approximation. Okay? And as I said, you can synthesize bedrooms and so on with that. Okay. So what we're now going to try to do is apply the tools previously described and apply it to all this. By the way, I forgot to mention, because I was in the topic, there's a lot of people who worked, of course, on that. Each time you'll sit on the slides, it's, the names are over there. So here, this is the work particular of Thomas Anglès and uh, Florent Angut. But there are many people uh, who uh, were involved in all these works. So, let me go to this problem of generation. Let's first look at the encoder. Basically, the problem is the following. You take an image data X, which is absolutely not Gaussian, absolutely not white, and you want to transform it in something which is Gaussian white. Now, in mathematics, there is one tool that allows you to build a Gaussian process from something which is not Gaussian. In high dimension, there is essentially one tool, which is central limit theorem. You average, and if you average, you are going to destroy structure and you are going to build something Gaussian. But if you average, you are going to lose information. So, how are we going to average? We are going to do the same thing that we did before. Before averaging, we are going to explode the information with a deep net in different channels. And this deep net will use wavelengths, okay? And then, we are going to average, and that's where you build something Gaussian. If you average things which are very decorrelated far away, you are going to build something Gaussian. And then, once you have something Gaussian, to make it white, you just apply a linear operator, which is going to diagonalize the uh, covariance matrix. This is simple. So, basically, two stages. One, you apply these filters, you get UX, then you average, and then you get your uh, linear whitening. This is globally be a linear operator which is going to mix all your variables. Then you need to invert. So from this, you need a decoder that is going to restore x. So where is the difficulty? The difficulty is not here. This thing, u, is easily invertible. Why is it easily invertible? Because the wavelet transform is easy to invert. And a relu is very easy to invert if you have two phase. Rho of A plus a relu of minus A goes you back to A. So there is no problem to invert that. Very stable. Where is the problem? The problem is the mixing operator. That's the linear operator that is Gaussianizing the whole thing. So if you want to reconstruct, 
what you basically need to do is to invert this linear operator and you have a linear inverse problem, but which is ill-posed. So I suppose some of you have been facing uh, linear inverse problems. When you have to invert an operator which is not invertible, the only way to do it is to use some prior information about the solution. In other words, you need to regularize the solution. One way to regularize the solution, and currently the most efficient, is to suppose that the solution is sparse in some dictionary. So what do you want to recover here? The problem is to re invert the L, so you want to recover the UX. So you want that UX is sparse in some dictionary. So you'd like to learn this dictionary, okay? We are facing a problem very similar to the one of classification. So here's the problem. In order to invert, you would like to find a dictionary which is going to sparsify precisely the scattering coefficients, okay? The UX. What you really want to do, your white noise, that's the input, okay? That's what you get. The white noise was the scattering coefficients, the UX, transformed by L. So UX is a sparse representation with a dictionary multiplied by L. What you see here, and that's the common trick done in inverse problem, is that your white noise has a sparse representation. In other words, the white noise can be written as a sparse vector multiplied by a matrix, which is LD. So what do you do? The generator is going to be this one. You are going to take your white noise, you are going to build a sparse representation of the white noise in the dictionary LD. Then from Z, you are going to reconstruct DZ, which is going to recover your UX, and then you are going to invert. And now, you need to learn. What do you need to learn? You need to learn the dictionary D. How are you going to learn the dictionary D? By optimizing the matrix, the, the dictionary, so that the error at the recovery is as small as possible, and that's the work of these guys. So you do a stochastic gradient descent. Now, what do you see? You see in this autoencoder, there is memory. What is this dictionary? The dictionary is the memory of the patterns of your autoencoder. You learn the patterns, and from these patterns, you can recover from something that looks white noise, something that looks like your original image. So these are the preliminary uh, results. First, you need to train. So you have your training database, which can be faces or bedrooms. And then you build your white noise, you invert. And then, of course, the whole thing will depend upon the size of your memory, the size of the network. Here we use the small network. So we only recover here. The high frequencies are not very well recovered, but still you recover these faces or these bedrooms up to details that are lost. Basically, the details will depend very much about how much memory you put in the network. Now, let's check the linear behavior. If you have an image recovered from white noise and another from another white noise, if you recover the image of the intermediate white noise, you get an intermediate phase. This is due to the fact that your wavelets are stable to deformations. So all the trans linear transformation in the uh, wavelet domain looks like a deformation in the original domain. So you gradually go from one to the other. Now, reconstruction. I'm going to begin from a simpler problem here. I have an image, and that's a problem that happens in physics where you have a coarse grain approximation of your problem, and you would like to get a fine grain model from the coarse grain. So here, this is the coarse grain approximation of the image. Now I use this average, and now I use white noise, and I generate image. Now, depending upon the white noise, you get high resolution image, but depending upon the white noise, you get different faces, different expressions, and so on. And then you can reconstruct also the low frequency. But there, we mess up a bit. So that's the images reconstructed from Gaussian white noise. 
they look like faces, but here we are messing up a bit the color. So there are recently slightly better results. We are still facing a problem. The low frequency basically are not so well Gaussianized. That's the bedroom, but still you can see you are getting the essence of the problem. Just the essence, because if I show you what GAN are getting, it's not quite the same image quite. But you should distinguish GAN and autoencoders. Why? GAN reproduce amazingly good images. But there is a trade-off. If you train a GAN from a database, there is something called mode dropping. The GAN will not be able to reconstruct any image of the database. It will forget some information. And one way to see it is you take this bedroom of images that was an experiment done by uh, Arthur Slam, and you look at all the images synthesized by a GAN. In this database, in the bedroom, about in 10% of these images, there are people. In all the images of the GAN, there is nobody. Basically, they forget. So you have this trade-off. Autoencoders are guaranteed to reconstruct your whole database. And therefore, the trade-off is they are losing some of the high frequency for fixed dictionary. GAN builds beautiful images, but in exchange, they don't reconstruct anything. In other words, the entropy of the random process is not bigger at all. So we still don't understand well what all these things are doing. But what I'm trying to show here is that, in fact, we are not so far from mathematics, which have been understood in different contexts. But obviously, there are a lot more works to be done to reach that kind of quiet. OK, so let me finish here. What is the morality of all this? The first one is I'd like to say that if you look at these deep nets, they are very complex because there is a huge number of variables. And in some sense, you can view them as a programmable machine, a bit like a Turing machine. Okay? So what is hard about building theories of such a thing is that it will depend upon the context in the same way that if you have a particular program, it's not going to do the same thing than a different program. So one has to realize that. Now, there is something that is very interesting about the whole framework is the global optimization. The fact that you can optimize the whole system with the gradient descent approach. And again, Francis will speak about that kind of thing. Now, if you think about now the uh, nonlinearity, in almost all these networks, you see that the first layers have filters that looks like wavelet. Now, in this context, what I've been trying to show is that the ReLU have a very particular role, is that they allow to build the interaction across scales. And that's interesting because in math, that was the kind of thing that was never done. Essentially, if you look at harmonic analysis, most of harmonic analysis has remained linear. If you think of all functional space studied in harmonic analysis, Sobolev space, Holder space, Buzov space, all this is completely nonlinear. Linear. Rolu throws us in a nonlinear world where suddenly one can see that you can do a lot more things and attack problems such as turbulence. Now, what is interesting again is that in a different context, if you go into the deeper layers in some sense, the Rolu can have a very different behavior. And in this context I showed you, I'm then we use the Rolu as a thresholding function to build a pattern approximation and to learn a dictionary. So I'm not saying that the deep net will do the ReLU here for this, here for this, and so on. I'm just saying that if you build a model, you, are see, you see that the ReLU have, can have very different behavior depending upon the type of property that you want to, to do. I think that one of the points which is still important is that currently we are learning networks which are not very structured. The only structure is we specify the number of uh, layers, the width, the number of batch normalizations, and so on. But if you look how uh, programming languages have evolved, I was comparing it to a Turing machine, one of the very important steps in order to make sure that you don't have a bug, in other words, 
in order to control the robustness of your system is to structure your program. You don't build a function with 2,000 lines. You divide your, your function into sub-functions, which are much smaller, that you can debug individually and so on. And that's a little bit the approach that we are taking here. Trying to show within a network, you see appearing different type of structures. Here, I've been showing two of them, and they may be uh, much more. And building from this structure also has an advantage, is that in this case, you can reduce the number of parameters that you can learn potentially, because the wave lets you know them, but you don't know indeed the dictionary <laughs> and that you can learn it. Now, uh, from a math point of view, and I'll conclude on that last statement, the problem is still totally open. If I come back to the original question, which was, what is the underlying regularity of the function f of x that I would like to learn? I haven't answered that question. I've just said, well, group seems to play a role to linearize the problem. Sparse approximation seems to be a play a role. But we don't have a global view of the problem. And the global view of the problem, ideally, would be to do the same kind of thing that what has been done in low dimension, is to specify the regularity with an index. And given this index, say, oh, the function has that level of regularity, so this is the number of neurons that I need to put in my neural net in order to reach an error that decay that fast. That's exactly the kind of results that you can have on a one-layer neural network that we absolutely don't have on multi-layers. So essentially, the problem remains open. Thanks very much.